So the discussion is an ongoing discussion we've had regarding the Vimalakirti Sutra. This month, it is chapter five, inquiring about illness. And I've chosen to do this in a more PowerPoint format instead of a handout uh, for reasons that I'll go into it later. But I wanted to provide the same background I do every time just to bring people up to speed. And you probably forget since the last time we did it. And some people may never have seen this, but the Vimala Kirti Sutra, as it says, focuses on a lay person who has exceeded the spiritual prowess of almost all of Shakyamuni Buddha's disciples and bodhisattvas. And he is pretending to be sick in bed to attract an audience of visitors who have come to wish him well and inquire about his health. And as a matter of fact, um, the story goes that Chakyamana Buddha had heard that he was sick. And that's when he decided he'd better have some disciples and bodhisattvas go to visit him and find out what's going on. And the sutra reaches its climax when Vimalakirti asks his audience of bodhisattvas to describe the nature of non-duality, which we all know is a major story in Buddhist teachings. <clears throat> and some of the important points to reiterate, the first is that awakening does not depend upon ordination. And you'll find in many other sutras and especially the Pali Canon, where if one is not ordained and hasn't gone through many lifetimes, then um, enlightenment is nigh on impossible. However, in this particular case, Vimalakirti uses upaya, skillful means, to teach that nirvana and samsara, at an ultimate level, the absolute level, are not different. And he asserts that a bodhisattva is able to live in the world, engaging in it fully, even to the point of partaking in its pleasures, passions, and defilements without being attached to them, constrained by them, or corrupted by them. And here I just want to make the point. The point is that it says the bodhisattva is able to live in the world, engaging, etc. That doesn't mean that the bodhisattva will always engage in it fully and not be attached. It means that the bodhisattva is able to do is able to do so. So it's something to aspire to, not something that happens sort of automatically. The narrative thus far, Burton Watson, whose translation I'm using, argues that the doctrine of emptiness is the central teaching of the sutra along with the related idea that since all dharmas are of the same nature, they are all non-dual, having a single ultimate quality. The Vimalakirti Sutra is one of the oldest Mahayana Sutra and contains the, the Majamaka philosophy of emptiness or shunyata as a foundational element. And some scholars suggest that this sutra may have served as a foundation for Nagarjuna's school that dealt with Shunyata. The story so far, it has come to Shakyamuni Buddha's attention that Vimalakirti Kirti has become ill in the first chapter. Buddha lands. We learn that Vimalakirti Kirti is actually using upaya, skillful means, as a way to teach the Dharma. And this is found in the chapter titled, Two Expedient Means. Chapter three has Shakyamuni Buddha requesting that his 10 disciples go to Bipim, visit Vimala Kirti. Um, however, each declines saying that they have not sufficient, they're not sufficiently competent to do so. And let me just say up to, up to now, sort of discussing these three chapters. When we're talking about Vimala Kirti, who is the, the character, the lay person, keep in mind that Vilna Kirti, this is a, a, I'm sure this is exactly what he looked like, um, representation of him. He was a relatively wealthy uh, merchant uh, in Vashali, and uh, according to the sutra, at least, a relatively wealthy merchant. 
And he had been practicing Buddhism for quite some time and had become very adept. And so when it was said that the various uh, disciples and bodhisattvas went to him and said that they're not competent to teach him, is because in the first few chapters, uh, he's he tells each of the disciples when they have visited him in the past or they've seen him in the past about what they're doing wrong. That even though they may be Shakyamuni Buddha's chief disciples, in the case of the disciples, therefore they are by nature arhats. They have reached the stage of awakening, and the next time, according to this viewpoint, they would have um, dissolved their sense of self. That even such an esteemed person really is not doing it quite right, and the Bodhi, even the bodhisattvas are told that all of their great wisdom and great compassion and great acts and great deeds, et cetera, still falls short of actually being as good as they should be. And the, the idea of using upaya is that by saying he's sick, he gets many people, we're not talking about just disciples and bodhisattvas, but townspeople to come and visit him and to ask how he's doing, and in so doing, he is actually propagating the Dharma. He's telling stories that allow them to understand in more detail what the nature of the Dharma is. And that's what it means by Upaya in this case. Uh, chapter four, Shakyamad, which we did the last time, Shakyamad Buddha now requests various bodhisattvas visit Bimala Kirti. And again, all the bodhisattvas approach to demonstrate why they are not competent to visit. And this leads us to chapter five, inquiring about the illness. In other words, finally, someone is going to go and visit Vimala Kirti to find out what's going on. Very simply, that means, do you have a heart problem? Do you have cancer? Did you fall down a well? What's going on here? And at that time, Buddha said to Manjushri, you must go visit Vimalakirti and inquire about his illness. Manjushri replied to the Buddha, world-honored one, that eminent man is very difficult to confront. He is profoundly enlightened, enlightened in the true nature of reality and skilled at preaching the essentials of the law. His eloquence never falters. His wisdom is free of impediments. He understands all the rules of the bodhisattva conduct, and nothing in the secret storehouse of Buddhas is beyond his grasp. He has overcome the host of devils and disports himself with transcendental powers. In wisdom and expedient means, he has mastered all there is to know. Nevertheless, in obedience to the Buddha's august command, I will go visit him and inquire about his illness. Finally, there's someone who's going to go see him. Then, as the story goes, continues, then the bodhisattvas and major disciples in the assembly, the Brahmas, Indras, the four heavenly kings, all thought to themselves, now these two great men, Manjushri and Vimalakirti, will be talking together and will surely expound the wonderful law. At that time, 8,000 bodhisattvas, 500 voice hearers, or Shravakas, these would have been uh, direct disciples of Shakyamuni Buddha, and hundreds of thousands of heavenly kings, beings, all decided at once that they would like to accompany Manjushri on his visit. That must have been some heck of a visit. visit. Manjushri, with this throng of bodhisattvas, major disciples, and heavenly beings, reverentially surrounded and accompanied him, meaning Manjushri, proceeded to enter the city of Vaishali. At that time, this is Vimla Kirti's house. I, I have it on good authority. This is yeah. where he lived. <laughs> At that time, the rich man thought to himself, now that Manjushri is coming with that great assembly at once, he employed his supernatural powers to empty the room clearing it of all its contents and his attendants leaving only a single bed on which to lay in silence. 
when Manjushri entered the house, he saw that the room was bare of contents with just one bed the, that Vimalakirti was lying on. Vimalakirti said, welcome Manjushri, come. And without the marks of coming, you see me. And without the marks of seeing me, Watson notes that the Vimalakirti and Manjushri do a brief pas de deux on the theme of non-dualism before entering their main dialogue. And, and I'm not going to go into, into that. <clears throat> Layman, this illness of yours, can you endure it? Is the treatment perhaps not making it worse rather than better? The world honored one countless times has made solicitous inquiries concerning you, Layman. What is the cause of this illness? Has it been with you long? How can it be cured? Vimla Kirti replied, this illness of mine is born of ignorance and the feelings of attachment. Because all beings are sick, therefore I am sick. If all living beings are relieved of sickness, then my sickness will be mended. Why? Because the bodhisattvas, for the sake of living beings, enters the realm of birth and death. And because he is in the realm of birth and death, he suffers illness. If living beings can gain release from illness, then the bodhisattva will no longer be ill. I'm going to choose just a selected element of the chapter because it would take quite a while to go through the entire chapter. What is meant by bonds and what is meant by liberation? This is later in the chapter. To become infatuated with the taste of meditation is the bondage of the bodhisattva. To be born in this world as a form of expedient means is the liberation of the bodhisattva. Wisdom without expedient means is bondage. Wisdom with expedient means is liberation. Expedient means without wisdom is bondage. Expedient means with wisdom is liberation. In this passage, wisdom stands for the current mental attitude of bodhisattvas in his effort to lead others to enlightenment, and expedient means stands for the actual methods he employs. The process of liberation or enlightenment is successfully completed only when both attitude and method are correct. Note also in this passage the reference to meditation. This is a caution that meditation without action in the world is a form of delusion that one can actually reach Buddhahood without physically relieving the suffering of all sentient beings. The term, what is meant by, is a common device in this chapter. It's used to contrast and compare, and specifically contrasting and comparing liberation, bondage, wisdom, expedient means, one and without, one with and one without. The point of this is, all of this is, that the bodhisattva needs both wisdom, prajna, and expedient means, upaya, for liberation, release from dukkha. One without the other is incomplete. In conclusion, keep in mind that the illness, Bimla Kirti, in, in that illness in Bimla Kirti Sutra, is a metaphor for dukkha. And this is used throughout the sutra. Interesting, it is the same in our modern lexicon. We refer to neuroses as an illness. It is an entry in the Diagnostic Statistical Manual, DSM, which is used for classification of mental conditions and disorders. Whether it's an organic pathology is open to interpretation and categorization. So using the term illness then and now are not so different. There's also the injunction that one should practice the six paramitas to understand the minds and mental activities of all beings. Further, by practicing the four immeasurable qualities of the mind or the four Brahma Viharas, the Bodhisattva is not greedy for birth into the Brahma realm. Further, the Bodhisattva should practice the four states of mindfulness, that is to say, con contemplating the body, sensations, emotions, and thoughts as a basic corrective. In other words, what we have in this chapter are some very direct notions, concrete notions about what is one to do if one is on the bodhisattva path. And when he's referring to bodhisattvas, he's not just referring to 
realized heavenly bodhisattvas, he's, realized, he's talking about people who are on the bodhisattva path. That includes most everybody here. Finally, Vimla Kirti states, and I quote, though he practices concentration in insight as method to aid one to the way, in the end, he does not sink into tranquil extinction, such as the practice of the bodhisattva. This is clearly a rejection of the arhat uh, way uh, in which it would be taught that through the practice of meditation, it's an aid to end uh, it, it, or the extinction of one's, one's self. And uh, one's provisional self will then not return into some sort of world. Though fully aware of all things are without birth or extinction, he adorns his body with auspicious features, such as the practice of the bodhisattva. Though outwardly displaying the dignity of a voice hearer or pratyakya Buddha, he never forsakes the Buddha law, such as the practice of the bodhisattva. Though aware that all things in the end are pure in nature, he responds to circumstances by showing himself in bodily form such is the practice of the bodhisattva. And that's the end of the quote that I will give you. This sutra is available online by several different, several different translators, namely Watson, uh, that, that would be Burton Watson, um, Bob Thurman, and Charles Luck. And the books are easily purchased and they're not very expensive. If you've not already done so, take the time to read and reread the sutra. You have received a brief taste of the teaching, now delve into it, and allow the teaching to nurture you. And now we'll go to, these are the sources that I used, that I've been using for the last five chapters. And now we, I will mute folks so that I can see what questions, comments, and thoughts you might have. So first, any questions, thoughts, comments about the sutra? Joe. Go ahead, please. A question about uh, something that you stated toward the uh, beginning of your talk. Right? Um, awakening does not depend on ordination. Then what's the point of uh, ordination? <laughs> 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 no, no, no. And uh, uh, Moshi says, you know what I'm referring to? Right? Um, next month, we will have public talk with the ordination. And That's you right. asked me to pick up uh, uh, Tanaka Sensei of uh, Hawaii Betzin from the airport to TVI. And I'm already wondering, you know, what I will talk, speak with him while I'm, I'm driving. And, and then I may ask, <laughs> I may play Vimala Kiriti and say to him that, you know, Tanaka Sensei, thank you for coming, but you know, <laughs> ordination is uh, pointless because we can achieve awakening without it. <laughs> So, uh, Monshi Sensei or Ichishima Sensei, what's, a, what's the point of having ordination if we can achieve awakening with, without it? Okay, uh, I'll let Ichishima Sensei answer. <laughs> <laughs> well, the ordination uh, is the uh, uh, kind of uh, recognition to be a Buddhist. And uh, so, uh, <clears throat> Uh, this kind of ceremony uh, is very important to be a, a <coughs> priest or Buddhist priest in Japan as well as uh, overseas. And so, um, and Tanaka Sensei, he's uh, from Japan and uh, he's, he stayed there, he has stayed there only a few months, I think, uh, since he was appointed. Uh, and uh, uh, well, he's a very frank person, so please uh, feel free to uh, talk with him during the driving. <laughs> and uh, yeah, ordination is just a, a kind of what should I say, a notification to be a Buddhist priest. And uh, so there are such a things uh, mentioned in the ceremonial uh, procedures. Maybe I will send uh, you the of translation, both in Japanese and uh, English to uh, Joe, Joe Sensei. Okay. Thank you, Sensei. So, um, I'll, I'll, answer, I'll answer the question in my way. Ichishima Sensei 
is, is doing it in his way. Um, I think that when one takes ordination in the Mahayana, I'm just speaking about the Mahayana because there's a difference between doing what ordination is to the Shravakayana contrasted to the Mahayana or the Bodhisattvayana. One is then taking responsibility not only for oneself, but for others. That's one of the important points. And a bodhisattva will sacrifice his or herself for the sake of the awakening of the other. That's part of the vow that one is taking. So it's in every organization needs a type of um, leadership, a type of, of um means to run the affairs of the organization. And Sangha is one of the central issues of the Triple Gems. And so the ordination is a way to provide a mechanism for the continuity of the Sangha. And it's also a means of, for some people who have chosen that path to then be responsible for the awakening or enlightenment of others. That would be the direct the direct quote. That doesn't mean, as a matter of fact, I would I would suggest something that Ichishima Sensei told me over 30 years ago that it is often more difficult to become awakened as in the ordained state contrasted to the lay state. That sometimes it's easier to be awakened as a lay person than as an ordained person. So it's the responsibility that the bodhisattva takes on. Is that I don't know if it satisfies your question, but it at least is an answer. <laughs> <laughs> any, any other questions? But that's that's a good question, Joe. Thank you. Any other questions? Oh, Joe. Oh, Joe, you had a follow-up. Yeah. In a way, this is related to the how to understand the overall message of the sutra. Is in other words whether to understand it as denying the whole value of monastic kind of life, or that it is saying that that's not sufficient, right? I, I, think, I think that what it's actually saying is it's not saying that the monastic life isn't sufficient. He's saying that it really depends upon what you're doing with your life, whether you're a lay person or you're a monastic. I think that that's one of the chief, chief messages there. And that's why one of the reasons why it's easier for a lay person to attain awakening contrasted to the ordained person because the ordained person is living in a monastic life and may not be in a situation depending upon the you know where they are the time that they live in etc of doing those things that save other sentient beings adequately whereas a lay person can do that on a on a daily basis i would suggest that taking care of your children is very important from a Buddhist perspective and raising them to be good human beings is <laughs> as important as anything that an ordained person is going to do. Okay? <laughs> I, I know, Job, Job's gonna be on me on this mm -hmm. and I can imagine that Tanaka-san's gonna get here <laughs> and Job is gonna be saying, well, here's what Tanaka-san <laughs> said to me about this. I, I know, I can see it coming. <laughs> Are there any other questions or thoughts people have? Because I guess I guess he's trying to make the distinction that it's not that that the monastic way is the only way, but that in fact, right? In fact, it's not the negative of the doing it. It's that it's the inclusion of right. both monastic and laity, that's which right. which was, is a sea change at that yeah, time. That's right. Was this and this was well before Lotus Sutra? Yes, this was one of the earliest sutras. Yeah. Yeah. One of the very earliest sutras, but certainly laid the foundation for what well, I, seen. and 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 so what well, I, I should I should just condition that a little bit. It's one of the earliest Mahayana sutras. Yeah, yes, yeah, it's one of the the first Mahayana mm -hmm. sutras. <clears throat> yes, yeah. be preceding the Prajnaparamita sutras or part of them. Well, we know that the Prajnaparamita sutra, at least the Diamond Sutra, was the first sutra that was printed. Uh, and if you look at, at um, uh, Saicho's, uh, excuse me, uh, Jigi's um, chronology, if you will, the Prajnaparamita Sutras would have come earlier. But historically, 
and maybe Shishima Sensei would like to address this, but historically, it's quite possible that the um, Vimala Kirti Sutra preceded the Prajnaparamita Sutras. What, what is your attitude toward that, Sensei? Yeah. Yes, uh, Vimala Kirti Sutra is very interesting. Uh, subject and uh, this is a balanced teaching between upaya and prajna and uh, upaya means uh, that is including first five perfections starting charity or patience etc or the meditation of uh, the six parameters we have the last six parameter is prajna parameter prajna parameter emphasizes wisdom the whereas other uh, what shall I say, charity, etc., meditation, etc., this is kind of upaya, skillful means how to attain, uh, how to save people out of suffering, etc. So only wisdom doesn't uh, exist, but uh, uh, wisdom with uh, skillful means that provides moksha, uh, liberation. That is a point of Bhimara Kirti and Yudesha, I think. So, Thank you. Mm -hmm. Sensei, do you think that the historically, in oh. fact, the Vimala Kirti Sutra preceded the Prajna Paramita Sutras? No, I think the Prajna Paramita uh, uh, is more earlier than Vimala Kirti. Okay. A little bit earlier, yes. Okay, thank you. Any other questions, comments? Yes, Seishin. Uh, Shoshin, I mean, I'm sorry, Shoshin. Yeah, would you please um, speak a little bit about rejecting the Arhat way? Well, I, I don't think that it was a rejection of the Arhat way as much as saying that the Arhat way was a provisional teaching, that it was on the way to the Mahayana teachings, that the Mahayana, that after, after the development of the Buddha way that people at the time earlier in the teaching period, meaning uh, at the time of Shakyamuni Buddha and shortly after, it was very difficult for them to understand the idea behind Bodhisattva as a living tradition. They understood the Bodhisattva as the heavenly Bodhisattvas, as ideals, as archetypes or something along those points. Okay. But I think that the, so it wasn't a rejection so much of the Arhat, but saying we've now moved beyond the Arhat and now it's time for us to embrace the notion that working for the benefit of others is more important than just working for the benefit of oneself. So it wasn't a rejection so much as a evolution of the Bodhisattva practice. Does that does that answer your question? Um, somewhat, but I, I, am always confused because one of the, one of the things we often talk about is how you know you you, you need to um, take care of yourself, you know, first. And to me, that sounds like what the arhats were doing, um, but maybe it's two different th uh, subjects. I, I think that, that what you, you're you're correct on one part that you have to take care of yourself first. On the other hand, you don't stop there. That's the point. You don't mm -hmm. stop with just taking care of yourself. Okay. Yeah. And, and, I, and I would even suggest that if you're only taking care of yourself, that becomes rather narcissistic. You know that you've got to you've got to look outside of yourself to really find. Uh, the benefits of the Buddhist, the Buddhist path. Anyway, any other thoughts, questions, comments? No, we're all done. Oh, okay. Gary. Gary. I, to put it in uh, kind of um, modern terms, it always felt to me as if this was a shout out to the layman. You mean the Vimala Kirti Sutra? Yeah. 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 Oh, I, I, I think it was. I think that, in fact, what it was, because remember, you've got this sea change. As, as Shoshin was saying a few moments ago, the Arhat was really 
uh, remember, the arhat could only attain awakening after ordination and after many lifetimes of ordinations. And in a monastic community, it was not possible at all for the arhat to attain uh, awakening as a lay person. And so the Mahayana changed that to a very large extent, to a radical extent. And I think that the Vimla Kirti Sutra was a way of announcing in very direct fashion, hey, you don't have to be ordained. Here it is. And But remember, that is only in the Bodhisattva path, not in the Arhat path. And so I think that's that's where it's, and again, to to touch on a point that Sandy was making, it's not a rejection so much as saying there's been an evolution taking place and here's where we are now. The Arhats are doing their thing, but lay people can also be awakened and the Vail Lake Kirti is an, is an example of that. So thank you, Gary. Quick question. Yes. Um, the Arhat notion is still um, very much alive and well in the Theravada tradition. Yes. That is it. Have to be in our hub that's still part of the rules. That's part of the rules. Right. <laughs> <laughs> any other any other questions? Okay. If the ship you're giving me a strange look. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I wasn't sure, sure, I wasn't sure whether Chip had a question or indigestion, but we'll find out. That's Sarah Ronnie, but I've talked to um don't, don't, you know, I mean, that, that, that seems to that the position of a Mahayana talking about Theravada, but there, um, there might be a, an orthodoxy, is what you're talking about, but I think there's also a, a movement within the orthodoxy, not, not to have. It uh, depends upon where you are. If you're talking about Theravada in South Asia, it's still very much what we've been talking yeah, about. Right. If you're talking about Theravada in North America, the yeah. Buddhist modernism has sunk in and they realize that they had they better come up with a better marketing plan. Right. To put it bluntly. Yeah. <laughs> so if there are no other questions, we'll move. We'll, yes, please. Come Before on. we end it, we should say happy birthday to Chimasense. Oh, oh. oh. yes. Right. Happy birthday to Shimasense. Oh. <laughs> she was sensei's birthday was two days ago. So yeah. or a day ago. Yeah. Well, two days ago to him, a day ago. <laughs> so happy birthday, Sensei. Thank, thank you very much. And now and now you're 83 years old. <laughs> oh, I'm ashamed. <laughs> no, you should be happy. <laughs> So happy Thanks, birthday. Happy birthday. Thank you. Happy birthday. So we're going to move along and the folks here will go out to the Hondo with Schumann. And then I'll be switching my location. Among the most popular sutras in East Asia, the Lotus Sutra arguably has the greatest doctrinal following. The Heart Sutra is likely the most recited. But the Vimla Kirti Sutra is among the most profound. It's not as sophisticated in its philosophical arguments as the Diamond Sutra, the Avatamsaka Sutra. And its position as the only sutra specifically about a lay person certainly makes it stand out. And as stated early, earlier, it may well be that Nagarjuna's refined expositions on Shunyata may have originated with this sutra. You know, I remember when I was in high school, um, I had Roman Catholic friends that I would speak to, and they would tell me that they never read the Bible, their, their Christian Bible. They basically said, well, that's the job of the priest. And then the priest tells me what the Bible is about. Um, I don't know the, the veracity of that. That's just what it seemed like at the time. And I had other friends who read the Bible every day. And they took it very literally. Some of my Protestant friends, they, you know, if it said, 
something in there, they felt that that's what should be done. It didn't so much confuse me as really led me to wonder how there could be such a big diversity between Roman Catholics and Protestants, for instance, as as a, a Jewish person growing up, um, reading the Torah on Saturday was the centerpiece of the Shabbat service. And of course, it was in Hebrew, so unless you spoke Hebrew, you didn't really know what was being said. But nonetheless, in the, the you know classes, the schools, you would find out what it said, and you read the the Mishnah, and you read the Talmud, and you keep steeped yourself in those traditions. And within the Buddhist tradition, some of the Zen schools, especially um, Soto Zen, would argue that reading the sutra is really secondary to meditation, that meditation is really the, the point of Buddhism. That's the bottom line. And then there are other Buddhists who would argue that one really shouldn't read sutra because it might confuse you. And then there's others who do read the sutra and they, they embrace it and they, they consider it very important. So we have a diversity within Buddhism also. Tendai position is that it requires both study and practice and what we do in the world. It's really a much more balanced position. Study is important. Practice important, practice meaning whether one is sitting meditation, one is doing calligraphy, one might be doing any chanting, one might do, be doing any number of, of activities, but then also living a moral life is equally, uh, there, there really is a balance among those things that in many ways, one is not more important than the other. They're all equally important. That's, that's really important. When we look at sutra, the method that, that I follow is one that I was that I learned years ago, and that is that th when you first approach a sutra like the Vimalar Kirti Sutra, read it like you would a novel. Don't dissect it. Don't take it apart. Just read it like you would a novel. What's the story? Then you write it. You physically write out what it says. You can do it in, in English. You don't have to do it in Japanese or Sanskrit. Do it in English. Then you recite it. Then you can go back and read it in a more analytic fashion. What is this really saying? Take it apart, if you will. And it's important when we do this as Buddhists that we're careful to keep an open mind, that we don't really argue with the text because you say to yourself, well, I believed this other thing all my life. How can I possibly believe that? Or that's impossible, whatever it's saying, that's just impossible. Read it with an open mind. Be a bit curious. Try to find out what is it really trying to say. Dig into it. Delve into it. Try to find out what is the basis of the teaching. Those, that method of reading it, writing it, reciting it, and then analyzing it has a very profound meaning both in the study of it itself, but also in your practice. So if you're sitting meditation, that practice of study of the sutra becomes fodder for the mind to work with when it's in meditation, even if you're not addressing whatever the sutra itself was saying. In and of itself, the material that's there will present itself. So it's important to approach the reading of the sutra as a practice, as important, as study, and as part of your spiritual journey. And I hope that everyone has an opportunity, takes the opportunity to, to do just that. It's really important to study as well as to practice. Thank you.
And I will move this to the quote for the day. And this is C.S. Lewis, who was, by the way, a very religious person. And the quote is, miracles are a retelling in small letters of the very same story, which is written across the whole world in letters too large for some of us to see. I love that particular quote. 